but also Africa and Asia. See this one. Yeah. So this, the, the way the session is structured is that we have four very short presentations, and you see, you do see or you don't see them li listed here, and this is followed by a panel discussion and Q and A. And with that, I'd like to hand over uh, to the to Elizabeth Jimenez from the Universidad San Mayor in Bolivia, who's going to uh, manage our presentations and keep us on time. Thank you. here with us for this presentation. I'm going to be presenting the first uh, pres uh, presentation for this afternoon. It's Eleanor Blomstrom. She's coming from the Women's Environment and Development Organization, WEDO, from the USA. Just um, for the organization of the entire session, we'll have seven minutes for each presentation around. Musical chair. No. Does the presentation waiting for the presentation to come, waiting for the presentation to show up so that you can follow along with what I'm saying. But I'll start out by saying it's a real pleasure to be here today and thank you to the organizers for having me. Um, uh, initially my colleague Janet um, Acharya from Kenya and UNEP was planning to be here but she was unable to. So luckily I've been working with Janet for years um, as part of the Global Gender and Climate Alliance um, since 2000. Nine, I've known her, and that's a, a it's a network of organizations working on gender and climate, specifically at this international policy level. And so, at we do that's um, it's been a focus of ours since 2007. And I think I'm starting out with this presentation to give this high-level sense of where are we, and kind of set the context. Why are we all sitting here in Lima today at the COP? and where does gender fit into the negotiation process. And then after that, my colleagues will be linking more to how are we seeing some of these things on the ground in this context of landscapes. So I'm not sure what the story is with the presentation, um, but I will just proceed, I think, in the interest of time. So what we always say is that there is, it's very important to know for everyone in this room, for women on the ground in communities and also for decision makers here at the COP, that there is a legal and normative framework that links gender and links climate change. And beginning with the 1945 okay. Universal Declaration on Human Rights through Rio Declaration. Great. Okay, so now you see we're all together. Um, and so this is a list of some of the agreements in the framework. And as I said, from the Rio Declaration, there were then three conventions, one of which is the Climate Convention. There's the Hyogo Framework for Action for Disaster Risk Reduction. Many of these either talk about climate change or gender equality or women's rights. Um, but the UNFCCC itself had zero references until 2010. It was sorely lacking. Everything else has considered gender. And so over eight years since um, the, there have been many women's rights organizations and other agencies working hard for this. This is just a timeline of how we've seen gender move through the negotiations. And um, what I had said before, the GGCA is what I'm part of and my colleague Janet as well. And there's also a women and gender constituency that's specifically for civil society within the process, which is also important. And as I'd said, there was no language until, to, until 2010. And in 2009, there was a lot of foundational text, but in Copenhagen we had an accord and not any kind of agreement, so there was zero language until Cancun. And then there was in Doha a decision on gender balance, 
which then led to a workshop in Warsaw last year to discuss how do we move ahead thinking about gender balance and gender sensitive climate policy within the context of the UNFCCC. And now we're here in 2014 and there's been a lot happening on gender, which I'll get to at the, towards the end of this. And um, I'm happy to talk with people more uh, afterwards about some of the excitement that we've seen in the past couple days. But what we're expecting is a gender decision to come out here at COP20, along with gender in, in several other places throughout. Another thing that's important to note that we often say, and the founder of my organization said this, women do not want to be mainstreamed into a polluted stream. So we also need ambition. It's not all about getting gender language or thinking about that. There needs to be an ambitious climate agreement. So I think I'm gonna move ahead. What was interesting last year at this workshop was how it discussed how can we, what do we need to think about here in terms of climate negotiations to get this framework of policy that will then determine national programming, national planning, national budgets, and also can help drive the research and the science that is taking place on the ground and really thinking how do we go from the international to the local and back up and I think I'm hoping this conversation will get to some of that today. So we are at COP20 and um, there's a lot of gender rhetoric out there and some of the disagreements over the past few days have been around this rhetoric do we want to talk about gender balance which is really how do we get 50% women and 50% men? Are we talking about gender equity? Gender equity is a tool to reach gender equality. The goal is gender equality, and there are many steps to get there. And then in the language of, that we see in the UNFCCC, um, we have recently produced this book, and it highlights all the decisions that mentioned, mentioned gender in some way. And it's really helpful if that's something that interests you. But what you find is that it will mention gender balance, it will mention gender sensitive, it might say gender considerations, might say gender responsive and sitting here in the audience you might say well I don't know what any of that means um, and for us there's sort of a, a, a hierarchy where gender balance is important but again it's not gender equality because you may have someone who's there and just a body who doesn't have the the capacity the knowledge who hasn't been afforded the opportunity to be as aware um, of the the content that they need so the aim is really for gender transformative which can in the end help to deconstruct some of, the, uh, some of the gender norms that run our lives and to work on transforming the power hierarchy and the power relations that, um, that we see that keep women from leadership positions and can affect decision making. So in this book it goes to, through some interesting stats that I won't spend a lot of time on, but I think this, graph, this um, graphic speaks for itself and you can see the gender balance in the current boards at the UNFCCC. And many of these are really important programs for things that are happening on the ground, for technology, for finance, for um, the, the group of experts, and especially the adaptation committee. There are actually 32 decisions in the UNFCCC that mention gender in some way, and the majority of them are within adaptation. It's, we need to really work on having more in finance, in technology, in um, mitigation, because it's important to have women's voices, but also the women on the ground who are involved in mitigation activities need a say in this and have many solutions to be brought in. And I think one thing that we could say is that often, if you're looking in this book and you can see where gender is mentioned, it will often talk about other communities often in relation to vulnerable communities, which is not the best, but it's a start to ensure that policies are, invo are, are involving people on the ground. There are also a number of decisions in here that then talk about indigenous or traditional knowledge, which is also extremely important. Um, I think the panelists will get into a lot more really why gender and climate change, so this is just a provocative question maybe have you asked yourself this? The IPCC has recognized that there will be different um, impacts based on age or gender or class um, or region, and it's important to recognize that. But that also it's the, the power relations that determine our experiences and our education and our opportunities is also critical. What we also need to get to is um, 
a better understanding. How does gender affect climate change? How does climate change affect women? How are women blocked from participating in these decision-making structures? And then where does women's leadership and effective participation in decision-making, where does that come in? There's a lot of research that says that diversity in decision-making is critical. And so here we are in gender equality and climate change. Where are we in Lima? As I said, there's been some excitement. There was something called the gender decision, which there's now a draft decision. And there was a lot of discussion about the, the terminology, gender balance or gender equality. And the goal is gender equality, but some countries were interested in keep, keep, keeping it more limited to gender balance, which um, in the end doesn't take us much further than we were last year or the year before. At the same time, there's gender in the, in the new agreement, which is absolutely critical. And we can't get lost in one decision on gender because there are a lot of places in adaptation and in mitigation and in finance that we need to keep working on. And especially in the programs, there's something called the Nairo Nai Nairobi Work Program that deals a lot with adaptation that uh, maybe some of these panelists even work within. And what does it all mean for action? I'm going to actually leave that to my panelists to answer, to my co-panelists to answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, actually, also for keeping the time. Next, we're going to have a Claudia Ringler from IFRI with us. Claudia? Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, why do we work on gender and climate change? In June, I was at an outreach event in Ethiopia, and we invited a lot of government agencies. And at the beginning of these events, I always ask, you know, so why did you come today? And in this event, two people told me they're here because they don't think there is a link between gender and climate change. So they want to understand why we do an event on gender and climate change. So that's the only reason they came. And so I think that perception is still very widespread because they feel, you know, climate change is one big phenom phenomenon and gender is another one, but there's no linkage. I think what we are saying here today is that there's many uh, very clear linkages. And so we did a study on, on four countries, Bangladesh, Mali, um, Ethiopia, and Kenya, to look at gender differences in perceptions and impacts, adaptation strategies, et cetera. And these are just a few findings across those landscapes. So we found that there is a very uh, clear, and obviously that was also known before, a clear gender gap in both tangible and intangible assets. And that means intangible ones would be education and literacy and social networks, and the tangible ones are basically agricultural land, agricultural assets, etc. And so while men actually, what we found is are more um, directly adversely affected from climate change because it tends to affect agriculture as a very sensitive sector, we also found that women's assets that are often smaller, like small livestock or jewelry, so they're smaller and more liquid than those of men, because men might hold like the land. And so they're more uh, easily and more quickly disposed of in, in, in when we have a climatic shock. So basically it means women, yes, they're also affected, but maybe more indirectly. What we also found is climate information that's getting you know, increasingly complex with those dynamic impacts of climate variability and climate change. Climate information doesn't reach uh, women as quickly and as comprehensively as men. So men have those formal channels to get the information. And when the information doesn't exist, the perceptions don't develop as well. And if you don't have a perception that there's a problem, you will not do anything about it. So that's a very uh, important issue. And we found that both in Ethiopia and Bangladesh. We also, probably unsurprisingly, found that women have less access to those agricultural technologies that help uh, adaptation to climate change. In the case study in Mali, um, we could eco econometrically show that men uh, in term were able to almost fully make up for production shortfalls as a result of climate variability because they had access to irrigation. Women did not have that access and could not make up for the production shortfall. We also found that women had only access to very traditional uh, agricultural technologies like the hoe and the men got those modern tillers, etc. Another important issue is risk aversion. There have been a lot of studies that uh, have shown that women are more risk averse than men. Again, if you're risk averse, you're less likely to take up new technologies or you know, try anything that, that's, that's not something that you have done in the past. 
our studies, we haven't found uh, that women are generally more risk averse in, in the overall, in their overall daily life, but we found that they're more risk averse in agriculture regarding agricultural decisions. For example, in Bangladesh, which is very surprising because women actually do not take a lot of decisions in agriculture in Bangladesh. But we, we, we think the reason is that women are so much dependent on men taking good decisions in agriculture that they are actually are very risk averse because they know their, their livelihoods and income depends on men taking good decisions. Mm, at the same time, again in Bangladesh, we found that women are actually interested in agriculture insurance products. Uh, even so, again, they don't take the decisions in agriculture. Again, we feel it's because they feel their income and livelihood so much depend on that. And obviously, there's now a lot of institutes, agencies that uh, are developing this weather-based index insurance. So that should be a good sign. But then we also found that women are much less, uh, have much less financial literacy. So if someone is trying to sell them a product, they will most more likely take a suboptimal uh, insurance de decision compared to men. So we have to be very careful because I know a lot of those agencies are saying, oh, let's target women. You can target them, but you have to be extremely careful that you're actually giving them the right capacity building and training. Because even in a setting where they received substantial training, they still took uh, suboptimal decisions and worse decisions than men in terms of uh, insurance. And finally, uh, we, we heard so the UNFCCC decisions, et cetera, so we are trying to get a lot of gender language in. And for example, the Ethiopian land reform um, has been very uh, gender sensitive, gender responsive. Both women and men are on the land title. So the thinking is now both women and men most likely will take more sustainable land management decisions and more sustainable land investments because now they have a land tenure in both women and men. We found again, that's not the case. And the reason is that the women have much lower um, knowledge about what the land title actually mean. They, they didn't understand land transferability associated with the land title. They didn't understand much about the, um, uh, the gender, the gender, why both you know, were on the title. And they also just didn't understand land tenure. And so women undertook uh, much fewer sustainable land management investments as a result. So what, what should we do? Um, for sure, we do need to um, you know, target climate information more directly to women. Uh, we could show that if women have equal access, for, for the case of Kenya, they are as likely to take, take up agricultural practices for adaptation. And that's actually a result from a researcher who sits here in the front row, Jennifer Twyman, because I haven't have undertaken uh, the research myself. Um, we also uh, find that if you're able to build up both intangible and tangible assets of women, then they will be more likely to really increase their resilience in the face of climate change. Uh, we specifically looked at group-based approaches. There's a lot going on, uh, group-based approaches for uh, credit instruments, joint uh, holding of uh, milk cows, etc. So there's a, there's a lot of good things that are going on. But we found that women generally, again, take less decisions. They have less time, actually, to spend on those group-based approaches. So we have to... Again, be very careful on how we approach this. It's not like, okay, let's get more women into groups and we have resolved the problem. It's not that easy. And finally, we cannot monitor what we can't measure. Um, so, you know, again, we, we, we interviewed, I think, about 200 agencies in those four countries in terms of what they're doing on um, gender-sensitive uh, climate change adaptation programs. And while most agencies are doing it and they feel that's the right thing to do, uh, many of them actually are not collecting gender data, and so they actually don't know if what they're doing is beneficial for women and men. And so basically, you know, we can't measure, I mean, what we don't measure, we don't know what we're doing, so we can't monitor what we don't measure. So we definitely need uh, much more, um, much more happening in that area. And so this is, those are really the couple of uh, summary results that I wanted to present here. And these are just a couple of resources in terms of publications, and they can be found out there, I think, in the gender booth and then the IFPRI booth, etc. And there's a lot of uh, more information online now today in terms of really gendered impacts on climate change, but I think a lot more work has to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. We next are going to have Cor uh, Corinne Valdivia. 
for the presentation. She comes from the University of Missouri in the USA. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, good afternoon, buenas tardes. I'm very glad to be here with this group of um, people talking about something that really matters to us. Uh, we've been working in the Andean regions of Peru and Bolivia in the Altiplano region to be specific. And so the experiences that I'm going to share here come from that work of many years of collaborating with um, small whole farmers, communities and universities in, in these two countries. The three messages that I wanna focus on are first of all, that context matters in addressing adaptation and resilience. We have to think about what's happening locally and who are the agents of change in those contexts. Second, that the perceptions of threats and risks are pretty high among women and men, but differ across landscapes, depending on what, where people are uh, developing their livelihoods. And um, that impacts the likelihood of taking on new knowledge if trust is not built. And finally, the last uh, point that I wanna make is that gendered participatory research processes and institutions are key in building adaptive capacities in vulnerable contexts. So we need to engage with local communities and with other stakeholders in building new knowledge. Um, here you can see um, a picture it, this is uh, Rosita, a community in Puno, and she, many years ago, shared with us about the use of local indicators for forecasting climate. The Pleiades is one, the Tola is another one, and those are biophysical indicators that help them predict when to plant and what the weather is going to look like. And it's key to potatoes, which are the food security crop for most of these environments in the Altiplano and in many Andean communities. Uh, one of the things that's happening here is that this local knowledge that has been adapted through generations is being challenged by by changes that are happening very fast in their context. So we have on the one hand that in the past 50 years, the temperature in this environment has increased one degree Celsius. Warming in the Altiplano means different things to different communities. We also have seen that the projections to the end of century for this environment are going to be on the one hand, a four degree Celsius temperature in average increase and uh, hopefully we can do something today and at this COP to figure out how to develop practices to change these, these projections. We also know that due to those projections that during the springtime when we plant, it will be drier. And during the growing season, you will have extreme rain events. So there will be the same amount of water, but unfortunately the soil moisture won't be there because the soils won't be able to capture that degree of moisture. And there are currently practices that allow us, uh, traditional practices that allow us to keep the soils moist. Uh, it requires a lot of labor and a lot of resources, and that's a key to making sure that the environment doesn't uh, lose humidity very fast. We also know that the wetlands, the peat bogs, the bofedales that we call them, are also key to retaining the water, but to carbon, to carbon sequestration as the soils are. So those are two, when, when you think about adaptation, you're thinking about building resilience in the ecosystem. These are two key uh, elements for building resilience, as is the biodiversity of crops. But they are also key to mitigation, as we can see by the ability to uh, um, keep the carbon in the soil and keep the water. What I'm showing up here is basically the landscapes that we worked in. So we worked in communities that were close to the, uh, to the Lake Titicaca, which is an important lake just uh, here between Peru and Bolivia, uh, all the way to high elevations of 4,000 and about 4,000 meters where pastoralism is mostly the um, key resource uh, activity for the livelihoods of people. In these communities, labor is a key resource. So as we think about um, trying to deal with adaptation, we need to think about how can we retain 
men and women in these communities? What are the incentives to stay there and do and continue these practices that bring resilience to the environment while they are impacted by negative market forces and therefore migration? But the experiences between men and women are different in these environments. In the high plateaus, there is a lot of um, migration, and women have to take care of managing the animals as well as marketing, as well as taking care of the families. And therefore, not enough labor is there to maintain the irrigation that's key to keeping the, the peat bogs in these environments. In other environments, like in the middle of the Altiplano in the northern, northern part of Bolivia, there's land fragmentation, a lot of migration, and women remain to manage the resources and to produce. These women and uh, men are facing uh, key um, risks, especially from uh, pests to their crops, frosts to their crops, and loss of animals, where, which are a key asset for, for families. They depend on those as their banking account. Therefore, in these environments with low level of income, there is a high degree of dread and fear about all these events. So we find, therefore, that in, in most of these environments, there is a lot of dread regarding droughts, frosts, and climate events. But there are also dreads regarding the markets and the behavior of the markets and the well-being and health of their families, especially the children. Under conditions of dread, the science has shown that people will be more likely to trust their own knowledge, which has been adapted for generations, to take on the risk of new knowledge. So what we're proposing and what we've been researching on our participatory approaches that foster two-way communication and trust, but at the same time address the issues of what can we do together? What can the science and local knowledge do working together to address these? And that is not just getting together and talking, that's trying to figure out what are the institutions that need to be built, the way we work together, what are the rules, so that this, this allows for women and men to participate in uh, creating these uh, new informations. And what I'm just showing in this picture is the way that we collaborated ac across the Andes from pe with people from universities in Bolivia, Peru, and the U.S., with people from the public sector, with people that are leading in their communities and making decisions every day. It takes time. It takes capacity building. So investing in uh, a way of mainstreaming gender, mainstreaming cultural and intercultural work, and developing the networks that provide access to information and political action are essential to being able to adapt locally. Thinking of adaptation as a good adaptation, not the, the, the negative adaptation that increases the vulnerability of families and the environment. Some examples, we're working on local forecast communications through networks where farmers and communities are providing information on what the conditions are. Why is this important? If you've been in a mountain, there is a lot of micro-regional variability, and currently the science doesn't have the capacity to provide good information about decision-making. So collaborations between farmers and tsunamis are essential in order to start to develop more information that's relevant to local decisions. Another example is working together to figure out what are the strategies in terms of soil conservation that contribute to building that resilience of the ecosystem. And we've done research with uh, farming communities across all these landscapes. We find that obviously um, manure combined with uh, chemical fertilizers is working better in these environments. And women prefer it because of the quality of the potatoes that they can produce for their homes as well as for the market. So th there are processes, but we need the capacity to do that. One of the things that we need to remember again is adaptation takes place locally. So how do we invest resources for adaptation, building the relationships with key decision makers at different scales and local communities to bring in resources to work together on adaptation strategies. We also need to uh, strengthen the way we do participation in order to 
build a social capital, meaning the networks that bring in new information and also bring people out to have political action and, uh, and voice. And finally, um, in order to build resilience, we need all kinds of actors. The key is that all actors have the same goal in mind. On the one hand, the well-being of the people that live there locally and have to negotiate these changes and the idea of building resilience in these ecosystems that not only benefit local communities, actually the water that we drink comes from those environments. The food that we eat comes from those environments. So we're all vested in trying to develop these types of um, strategies that actually build these connections. Uh, just in case for, for more information, there is a flyer outside where you can find some references of the work that we've been doing together and um, many um, references and uh, information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Corinne. Now we're going to have Gladys Vila Piue. She comes from the Organización Nacional de Mujeres Indígenas Andinas y Amazónicas del Perú. So, Gladys, adelante. Paella, Payanchikpa, Jokayin y Sumas Poncha Ocachun. Gracias. Primeramente, agradecer esta oportunidad que nos da. Thank the organizers for this opportunity, so that the voices of the indigenous women may be heard in this important proposal, where we cover gender and resilience in climate change and how to include our proposals in COP20. In my presentation, I would like to focus on three aspects. I would like to show you some pictures as well. Well, first of all, I would like to describe the current situation with the indigenous women in the Andes and in the Amazon rainforest of Peru are going through. And then I'd like to make some proposals and then convey some messages. As we can see in our communities, women. The indigenous peoples have always lived in harmony with Mother Earth. To us, the land and our habitat are part of Mother Earth. Therefore, Mother Earth gives us food, medicine, and shelter because that's where we live. However, we should also take into account that in recent years, human beings, through a large number of activities of different kinds, have damaged, have hurt Mother Earth. And for example, in the case of Peru, every three minutes nowadays we lose one hectare of forests due to deforestation. This is a matter of great concern women have. And in Peru as well, 70% of the foodstuffs that we have in the cities are produced by small farming. Small farming that mainly involve Amazonian and Andean women. However, there are no public policies that are aimed at reverting the situation. Here, people say that Peru is very rich in gastronomy, but still, at this point in time, there are many brothers and sisters in Peru that are hungry, that have nothing to eat. And our landscapes, such beautiful landscapes, apparently there are some technical problems and they cannot show you the pictures that I would have loved to show you. Because uh, we have beautiful landscapes in the Andes and in the Amazon rainforest, but they are being lost because 
uh, there is no um, sense of life anymore. And that is why Amazonian and Andean women within the framework of COP20 demand clear commitments and policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis climate change. We cannot talk about climate change uh, when there are no policies, especially in terms of adaptation. The issue of uh, mitigation is being covered, but adaptation is not covered. And then adaptation policies are of the essence for indigenous women, because nowadays, when the weather changes, we lose our production of potatoes, corn, or fruit. and. We have no funds in order to make up for that loss. Therefore, it's important for the Peruvian state and all the other states that are part of COP20 take up some policies uh, for adaptation purposes. And we also demand some prior conditions, because as it's been said here, there's n it is not possible that we still live in a country where our territories, uh, where our peasant communities uh, uh, do not uh, have uh, property uh, deeds that may guarantee uh, ownership of uh, the land. Therefore, we demand completion of uh, ownership uh, deeds. And then we also demand consistent policies, uh, because today people talk about red plus, but we cannot talk about red plus if uh, there is no comprehensive vision. We talk about forest protection, but we cannot talk about the forest if we do not talk about the glaciers, if we do not talk about uh, the origins of water, because uh, we would not be able to have a forest uh, if we do not uh, keep the glaciers, if we do not protect the glaciers. The ecosystem is a comprehensive uh, matter. We cannot talk about the Amazonian jungle on the one side and then about the Andes on the other side. This is something comprehensive, and that is why we say that if we lose glaciers and if we lose our eyes, uh, it's quite likely that uh, our cities will be left with no water. That is why we demand an active participation of women and the indigenous peoples in all the spaces uh, where decisions are made. Today, uh, COP20 discusses uh, these policies. Nevertheless, uh, there is uh, an issue that limits the participation of indigenous peoples. The indigenous peoples and women are limited or have limited access. I would like to conclude by conveying some final messages of uh, women members of the National Organization of Indigenous Women of the Andes and the Amazonian area in Peru. If trees uh, provided Wi-Fi, I'm sure that all of us would be willing to plant a tree. Uh, that is why I invite all of you to plant at least one little plant in our backyard or territories. The indigenous women give life, and that is why we defend life, the life of our Mother Earth uh, that shelters all of us, rich and poor, those who live in communities and those who live uh, in different parts of the world. We would also like to continue taking care of water, water that is becoming scarce and scarce in the highlands. And uh, the cities will be left without any water as well. And that is why when we turn on uh, the faucet, we should think that we should try to save water. Because of all this uh, and because of everything that we are seeing related to climate change, uh, we invite you on the 10th of December, the International Day of Human Rights that in Lima, to join us in our march. We invite you to join us in our march at 9 a.m. at Campo de Marte, where you will hear our voices, our thoughts, our feelings, and our proposals, the proposals of the indigenous women regarding climate change. Don't just look at us. Come join us in our march as well. 
I wanted to show you some pictures uh, of uh, deforestation, but also of the beauty of uh, our landscapes when we plant some seeds. We say that we use one seed to grow a forest and we want that seed to pro produce forests that could be seen uh, by our children and grandchildren. Thank you very much to all of you, and I hope you take in your hearts this awareness in order to contribute from your homes, from your communities, and from your work to this goal. Thank you very much to all. Thanks again to our presenters. We already got, uh, I think, some very nice applause. And we'll move right away into the next part of the session, which is the panel. And we have four distinguished panelists here with us, uh, including Juan uh, Ratigi from the Ministry of Culture here in Lima, Peru. And next to him is Cecilia Turin from the International Potato Center, also again uh, right here from Lima. Uh, next to uh, Cecilia, we have Anne Larsen, who works at the Center for International Forestry Research, C4, out of Indonesia. And next to her, we have Elizabeth Jimenez, who so ably managed also the presentations, and she's with the uh, Universidad Mayor San Andres in Bolivia. With no further ado, I'll ask uh, one or two questions, and then we'll move over to the audience. As we have a slight gender imbalance, we'll start with Juan. Juan, so this session, you know, that you have now heard some presentations and also you have seen the title, it, it has the premise, or it's based on the premise, that climate change gender interactions are actually attenuated by landscapes, so that they differ by landscapes. Peru, um, where we are here today, has one of the richest variety of landscapes that you can find anywhere in the world. We have the Sierra, we've heard about the Sierra, we have the Selva, we heard about the Selva, and obviously we have the coastal desert where we're here today. What do you think? Are there differences between gender, so between men and women, regarding climate change, and are there differences between you know, the various regions that you work on? And I think you're specifically engaged um, in the Amazonian region. Please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank you for inviting me. Then I would like to congratulate uh, all the speakers for the brilliant presentations uh, that have described uh, studies uh, carried out. What I would like to say is that all forms of life uh, in the indigenous peoples uh, are comprehensive strategies uh, to adapt uh, to climate change. And this is not just now. It's been done so for years and years. Men and women of the Andes uh, and the uh, rainforest in Peru have been doing this for years. Therefore, it should be acknowledged that the indigenous peoples play a major role in the maintenance and recovery and adaptation of ecosystems. We should not forget that that intrinsic relationship that we've always had between men and nature is so important. We need to bear this in mind, especially when we talk about the indigenous peoples. There's another important aspect to guarantee respect and to promote adaptation strategies used by the indigenous peoples based on traditional knowledge, based uh, on uh, the wisdom of the forefathers, as has been done throughout history, wisdom that has been conveyed from one generation to the next. This way of life uh, should be promoted and maintained because uh, it is part of their own lives, and it's also allowed them to preserve those forests throughout different generations. But I would also like to point this out. For thousands of years, indigenous women have taken care of life. So in this process of climate change, not only are they victims, 
but rather they are also active participants in the adaptation process, securing food for future generations. So in that regard, uh, the uh, participation of uh, Antian and Amazonian uh, indigenous women uh, uh, has been very important. There's always been roles played by men and women. Women uh, have uh, taken care of the family and it's always been something very much respected by men. Same thing goes uh, uh, regarding men. Men dealt with some aspects uh, that uh, were not to be disclosed. So each one played uh, its or his or her own role. Well, so. I think that in addition to all this that has been mentioned, that is that we do need some training. Of course, uh, training is uh, needed, training uh, about uh, strategies on how to preserve forests from the Western world in order to generate some sort of a joint strength, a joint force to help us preserve life itself. It is also important uh, to point out that participation of the indigenous people should be at a great length, especially when uh, there are aspects related to the territories where they live. And uh, these processes should uh, continue throughout history. Thank you very much. Very interesting and exhaustive response with a focus on on the role of women um, in the Amazonian forest. So I'll move on to your neighbor on the left, uh, Cecilia. So we've heard from Corinne that the Andes region has this very diverse microclimate. So there's a lot of differences. There's also the center of agriculture, as we've heard from Gladys, up there where women produce potatoes and men and a lot of the food that's then being consumed in the cities and the coastal areas here. So how do women and men in those Andean regions struggle and how do they achieve to increase resilience you know, to, to this very rapid increase in temperature that we have already seen in the Andean region and to this more erratic rainfall, please. Can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, first, I just want to uh, mention, uh, uh, address mm -hmm. the. Uh, I was touched by the message of mm -hmm. Gladys because I think she gave us a mm -hmm. lesson to know how indigenous people look, uh, have integrated approaches. They, even their their own organization, which is an. Uh, Andean and Amazonian, so give us a, a lesson of how they integrate mm -hmm. so they don't see separated as sometimes science is just focused on one and the other. So related to the question, um, uh, women and men, uh, according to the landscapes where they are, they, in the Andean region, they uh, build their resilience in different ways. Uh, pastoral leads, for example, in the high Andes, they are in charge of the, I mean, the water management, I mean, the ranch lands and pit box, and so that is related to the water, uh, the water, the maintenance of water sources and also the carbon stocks. And so they, uh, they are struggling with the climate change because of the, like you say, the high temperatures and that the uh, productivity of the rangeland are decreasing the same as the pit box, so they are use, making a intensive use of, of those resources. So the resilience uh, that they, they have very little uh, diversification opportunities given the landscape where they are. So they, the resilience they build to uh, strengthen their networks, the social networks, and also they insert to the new markets, but those new markets sometimes they are like, for example, al pastoralists of alpacas, they are, uh, for alpaca, they, they turn to alpaca meat market and also to handcraft markets. So in the other side of the Altiplano, which is more the potato and quinoa farmers, so they are struggling with different, um, uh, with different, uh, impact of the of climate change so they are um, 
their local knowledge, they have, uh, uh, they are kind of deteriorated because of migration and other um, of the processes that they have been describing uh, Gladys and also Juan. So they, uh, they are the custodians of the, bio of the biodiversity. And so they, uh, they also have different ways to build the resilience. So they insert again to the new market, but they, um, they work with, uh, with, they insert to new associations also, they insert, they as well as, as strengthen their social networks. Uh, however, in this case, they have uh, less access for local climate forecasts. Mm -hmm. So that, um, so that is something that uh, I think we need to consider according also what we have heard in this, uh, with these speakers. Um, so I think that they have in the same, in the same area, you can find different uh, ways to address uh, climate change. So according to what they, uh, according to the landscape, so context always, I think, matters. Markets are differing in both, uh, both sides. I mean, uh, pastoralists and also lowlands with potato and quinoa producers. Um, the way they insert to markets also are different. While in the lowlands, uh, markets are more dynamic, so they have more access to the markets. In the highlands, pastoralists uh, they live in remote areas with very low communication, mm -hmm. so they are more, they have more challenge. Mm -hmm. So I think the so this is a challenge also for the adaptation programs and adaptation policies that they need to consider all that diversity of landscapes, even when they are mm -hmm. kind of from the same area. Mm -hmm. So they are diverse and also they have different ways to adapt to to changes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now we move into a different area different arena. We move from adaptation to mitigation. So, and you heard that Eleanor said in these UNFCCC negotiations and decisions, we have almost nothing related to gender in the mitigation arena. Actually, it's the least. So why is that? Is it because mitigation is all about models and about technologies, geoengineering, and there's no people related to that? Or is mitigation different from adaptation? We don't have to worry about uh, women and men's uh, women and men's concern and mitigation. And could you focus there on your experience in Red Plus and also on those various landscapes you've worked on? Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, so I apologize that it's, it's true mitigation has gotten a lot more attention, but unfortunately gender isn't being taken into account in mitigation and that's what I'll, I'll be able to talk about today. Um, first of all, I just, could I see a show of hands for people who don't know what red is? People basically have a an idea of what red is. Do I need to explain very briefly? See a couple hands back there. So just very, very briefly, red is, called, is a program called Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Degradation. And it's aimed at, it's basically a financing me mechanism to try to lower carbon emissions by lowering deforestation and degradation. That's the only, all you really need to know for the, for the moment. Um, so in terms of your question, um, there's a big, been a big push since the early years of RED to, uh, regarding concern about people living in forest people, forest communities and indigenous peoples from the people who pushed for RED from the beginning as well as people who were opposing RED. And so it's been, so the idea of it being participatory has been pretty important from the beginning. Um, the safeguards debate here this week has been really important, for example. This hasn't been entirely successful, but it's been given enough attention that we can say it's not just about models, but it's also about trying to account for people's behavior, or at least including people. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, okay, what is people? Um, who are we talking about when we mm -hmm. talk about people? And in spite of all of the efforts to, in, to improve participation of communities, we know from years of research that uh, communities are differentiated, and we can't assume that by including or by having community representation or any other way you look at community, if you don't address the internal differentiation, including um, gender, ethnic differences, and so on, um, this may not be sufficient. 
So first of all, just very briefly, why might red affect women? Uh, is it something women should be concerned about? And the primary goal here is to lower carbon emissions coming from forests, and that means changing behavior in forests. And many of the red projects around the world have really focused on smallholders and communities and the, these drivers, the, the direct drivers of deforestation in communities. So anytime you're talking about changing behavior on, of land management or forest use in the, on the ground, you're affecting also uh, not just men but also women. So I just take that as a given that there's a risk for women as well. So one might cons conclude that then we ought to make sure women are participating, right, in these processes. So I just want to briefly run through some research that C4 has done on uh, villages where, where red projects are being implemented. We did this research. I'm going to present results on 20 different um, red projects, 77 villages around the world uh, that had enough data at the time we did this. These were early red projects, so they were really uh, just the beginning stages. New research has since been done, but it's too quick to have, it's too recent to have been analyzed. The countries were Cameroon, Tanzania, Peru, Brazil, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And what we did was compare the results, one of the first things we did was compare the results of focus groups. We had focus groups just with women in communities, and we had village focus groups, which were 67% uh, men. So they were the, we'll, I'll call them the mixed groups for now. And what we did was ex assess in each of those groups, among many other things, uh, the extent to which they understood, they had a basic understanding of what red was or, or the local project. We didn't necessarily call it red, we called it in the terms that people would be familiar with in their own communities. And what we found is that 41% of the women-only focus groups demonstrated a basic understanding of red, 67% of the mixed village groups demonstrated a basic understanding of red. That's a difference of more than 60%. So clearly women were less informed about these projects that were being discussed in their own communities. So for those, and then we went along and asked some more questions. So for those who did actually know something about red and understand it, uh, to what extent have they in, been involved in the decision to implement RED? And there the gap declined a little bit, but still we saw a difference of 43% women groups versus 55% in the mixed group. So we still see a, a difference even where people are knowledgeable about RED. These weren't decisions that women were participating in as much as the men were. So then we tried to understand why, and we looked at four different issues that we researched. So our hypothesis was more or less that these groups would be more balanced in the same villages. You would expect similar knowledge among men and women. If women were actually actively participating in their own communities around decision making, if women used the forests as much or more than men in those communities, if projects from the beginning stated they had a specific interest in gender equity or something of that sort, or, and or where women participated in forest rulemaking in those communities. And what we found was, in fact, with the first three of those, there was no relation at all. So in communities where uh, women were active and believed they had an impact on village decision-making, they were represented in village uh, elected governance bodies, where they used the forests even more than men, and where projects started, began saying they were going to, to address equity, there was no relationship whatsoever in terms of the balance between knowledge. The only thing that made any difference was forest rulemaking. In that case, women were closer to being on par with men and around knowledge. So the results on participation were particularly telling, um, including women in meetings, in leadership bodies, even where women perceived they were able to influence village decision making, um, they, and where they used the forest more than men. None of that was significant to guarantee that women's specific needs or interests were being under, would necessarily be understood or addressed. So participation is definitely not enough. Um, and in terms of local context, I just want to mention that uh, we didn't do a lot of, a lot of comparison uh, at country level, but just to, to mention that the data in Brazil, men, men and women had much more similar levels of knowledge and both were informed about red, um, whereas uh, Vietnam there was not much knowledge on either part and the others shall all fell into the groups where there was a, definitely a difference 
um, between genders. So I'll stop there for now because I've probably used my time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we, uh, we now go to the last panelist, Elizabeth. And I'd like to move him beyond the UNFCC negotiations because next year we will not only hopefully have a new agreement on climate change, but also one on the sustainable development goals. And gender obviously matters equally uh, for those goals. So from your work in Bolivia and the highlands, do you have a message you would like to give to the similar negotiators, target negotiators for the sustainable development goals? Yes. Um, indeed, I think um, we'll have to think and um, put in place the debate on sustainable development. And one of the things I would like to say about that is that climate change is very well linked. The issues we deal when we talk about climate change are very well linked to the, this big issue that is, has to do with sustainability and development. Mm -hmm. So to me, that, um, that's a very strong and a very important message we need to give out, uh, to these other debates. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to briefly uh, mention at least three levels in which climate change and issues related to sustainable development are very well linked. Mm -hmm. To start with, we have seen along these presentations of this afternoon that climate change and adaptation has to do with the management on natural resources. We're talking about land, talking about uh, water. Corinne's presentation was also emphasizing the need to think about labor migration, and so on. So these are key natural resources, and adaptation to climate change has to do with the management of them. And managing such resources as at the national level is dealing with sustainable development, because what we don't want are adaptation strategies that are aimed at survival, short run, and just immediate results, because what we see in some of the contexts, particularly in Bolivia, where I'm coming from, is that most adaptation strategies among groups that are more vulnerable, the peasant communities that Corinne was talking about, some of them, a lot of them, I would say, have to do with short-run um, objectives and survival needs, which is obviously completely understandable. But from a perspective of sustainable development, we need to look beyond that in the long run and ensuring the sustainability of such management. Now, if we think about non-renewable natural resources, such as um, mining, gas, lithium, which is the most newest non-renewable natural resource in Bolivia now, um, also, they also have to do with sustainability, of course. Most countries um, in Latin America have historically depend on such uh, the exploitation and use of these resources, what, what we call extractivism, that has been very rooted to our patterns of economic growth and so-called development. But the, the irony in this is that um, extractivism is not associated to sustain, sustainability at all. And furthermore, extractivism actually is competing currently for, for the management of sustainability of other resources, such as water, land, and labor. So you see, I mean, just the, the linkage in these two, just these two examples of um, how climate change is also related to management of natural resources and how the management of non-natural resources, usually aimed at economic growth and short-run benefits, um, are also in play into this. I and mean, if we, we can also think about other issues, such as seguridad alimentaria, right? Uh, food security. So sustainability uh, the, uh, and development practices oriented to sustainability are very well linked to what we should be thinking in terms of um, practices aimed at um, dealing with climate changes, but in a sustainable way. So 
what the message, I think the big message is to think seriously about these interlinkages. Mm -hmm. We are not longer able to uh, separate such as issues and think about economic growth as having one agenda, obviously, but we cannot also think about an agenda of managing natural resources um, apart from dealing with climate change. So I think this is indeed a very strong message that should be taken into account. Okay, thank you very much. I'll now open it to the audience for questions. At the end, I'd like to get back to the panel and the presenters to just give me one key message in one sentence on what the negotiators should do on gender. But first, please, uh, I'll open it to the floor. We have a mic here. If you could just raise your hand, uh, say who you are, where you come from, and if you actually know to whom you want to ask the question, please do so as well. So. I'm uh, Muriel Saragusi from Brazil. Um, I'm quite, uh, I, I don't understand why we didn't talk about water. Uh, because uh, for women, uh, part of her tasks uh, when they are at home is dealing with water, the water supply of the house, and they do this uh, on the top of all the rest of the work she do on the fields, on the forest, and everywhere. So um, the shortage of water will impact heavily and more heavily on women than mm -hmm. on men. Uh, how we deal with this? We, we have data in Brazil that uh, women in rural areas uh, spend more than four hours a day looking for water. So mm -hmm. uh, let's deal with it on adaptation and also on mitigation because it's their daily life that is passing by. That's why they don't have time to be informed about what is happening. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? We have one here and one here. Yeah, maybe we start first and then move over here, yeah, so. Um, my name's Megan Rowling, I'm a journalist. Um, I was just wondering for Anne, um, what are the solutions to getting more gender equality and mitigation then? Um, do you have ideas about that? Um, because it seems like there are specific barriers um, when it comes to, to mitigation. But I mean, you talked about red research, but I didn't quite understand why specifically mitigation is worse off in this area than adaptation. Mm -hmm. Okay, another third, uh, third question. Thank you very much, and thank you for presenter for this uh, informative presentations, and uh, uh, the one who had some information concerning other issue. Uh, my um, Hanadi Awadallah from Sudan, um, extensionist, uh, forester, representative for uh, extension department. So uh, my first question. Uh, concerning the empower of women society uh, to negotiate their own problem concerning climate change because we are not uh, all time need to negotiate on behalf of them. So is there any issues concerning uh, arrangement in a, in a community society so as to raise their own problem and negotiating uh, so as for marketing, for energy, uh, alternatives, and um, for, uh, for, for that uh, issue concerning their crop protection and all, uh, all challenges they face. Because if they empower them, they, they, they maybe they uh, negotiate in behalf of themselves, not uh, by our aid all time. Uh, my other question concerning mitigation, I, I need some, uh, if there is capacity building concept, 
We know the safeguard maybe uh, is uh, concerning the uh, environmental safeguards, social some safeguards. So is any specific safeguards concerning gender? And is there any capacity building so as to, uh, to strengthen women concerning the safeguard? Uh, my, my, my third question is uh, uh, concerning uh, the, uh, the adaptation. Uh, what the challenges so as to uh, enhance women to, to, to defense about their crop production and marketing and these issues? Thank you very much. Okay, one final and then, whoops. Okay, one final back there because of our gender balance, we have to take a man, sorry. And <laughs> then we, we go back to the panel. Sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Javier Rodriguez. I, uh, I come from Spain, but I live in Ecuador. I work with social water management issues and I would like to thank you all for the, for the session. I think that it was really interesting. I really like, for instance, the thing that Gladys said about de una semilla nace un bosque. Uh, I think that it was really inspiring. And I was, um, I really, it's just a follow-up of the thing that Mrs. Muri uh, Saragusi said uh, about the, the issue of water, because I work with this. I think that uh, it's very interesting, the, the issue of uh, forest governance and landscapes governance, but also the interaction with water governance, because you were uh, raising the question about Mm, the interaction between the Andes ecosystem, the Amazonian ecosystem, but what is exactly the role of women in this kind of water governance systems that we are building? Because I'm pretty much familiar with it, but we don't take women or this gender issue in the, uh, as important as I think that it is. And uh, I think that it's very important for the mitigation and adaptation question, but I never heard uh, this interaction between these two dimensions. So I would like to know your opinion about it, the water governance thing in, in mm -hmm. general. Yeah, thank you very much. So as the chair, I'll talk a little bit about water, at least for the first question. Um, we had a couple questions on mitigation, and I think both Eleanor and Anne can answer those together because some related to the negotiation process and some related more to the, the research that informs why we have to do much better in the negotiation. And then we have the, some additional question on water governance specifically relating to the Andes. Uh, I'll ask Corinne, and if anyone else, uh, like Vladis or Juan, want to come in there. And then we have a question from Sudan on a variety of issues, the mitigation piece, empowerment of women, and so how we can empower women to be basically adaptation um, champions, to be the champions in adaptation. and. I think all of us can answer that, and I maybe we'll ask Elizabeth to do that. So quickly on why did, why did we not have a lot on, on water um, and, and women's concerns related to water? I think it was just a question of time. When we did our qualitative um, focus group discussions, for example, in Bangladesh, but also elsewhere, in terms of the key concern that women had regarding climate change impacts, it was water. Um, it, and for the men, it was more, you know, the agricultural production, the value, can they market their crops? But for women, it was always water, because as you said, uh, water resources are getting scarce as a, re as a result of climate change, but of course also as a result of many other uh, developments. So yes, water is, is a key concern for women. Um, and the other, maybe the other result on, on water is when we did research in East Africa on uh, desired adaptation options, when we asked women and men actually uh, Irrigation is, is the most desired, but not easily implementable um, uh, adaptation option. So yes, water is, is very clearly associated um, with that. I'll hand over first to talk about water governance because it's the second water question. Corinne or any of the other speakers focusing uh, specifically <laughs> on the Andean regions, can you take that? So in the, in the Andean region as well, water is really important and it's one of the first priorities that farmers talk about. Uh, especially the ability to control uh, the longer periods of dry, the longer dry periods between the planting and, um, and the longer rains. I think one of, the, one of the issues that we indirectly talked about water is 
about the effect of climate change, uh, temperatures rising, and evapotranspiration. So we were more concerned at that point in working with what can build resilience to the system. Water is a key issue, and Cecilia can talk more about that because there is a water management system within communities currently, and uh, actually uh, people in the communities that are creating the water are also having to pay for the management of that water in uh, Andean communities. So Cecilia. Yeah, I think that's, that's the point why gender matters, because in the communities, for example, in the pastoralist, in the pastoralist communities where I have been working, uh, women are really concerned about water scarcity and they propose, okay, we want to uh, build water reservoirs or, um, or, or irrigation systems, any way to improve the water access. Uh, but they are not, I mean, they have little voice and they don't have really the power in the community decision. So while men, when they are asked, okay, if they have something, when they want to, when they um, want to invest on something, so they propose, okay, no, we need more improved animals or we need more. So they are thinking in other, because actually men are the, who make decisions, but they are not the permanent persons who are in charge of the managing of the water and the rangelands or the pit box. So they migrate, but they made the decision. So they, it's not that women don't make the decisions, but they have less voice. So the priorities always are kind of men. Um, so yeah, I mean, they, they really are concerned about water and they propose those things, um, but they have little voice. That's why it's important to, uh, when they are key, uh, when they are the key managers of the resources, so I think they need to be to have a um, strong voice or to be have more political participation to set the priorities in the communities and also in the local government to influence local government decisions so I think um, yeah that 's what I mm -hmm. can say. Uh, the other thing that I was thinking is that before they had um, in, in the past, I think they have more uh, strategies to improve the water management, but they are labor intensive. And, and they need like physical <laughs> uh, force to work and a lot of labor, but they don't, they don't have that labor because of, mm -hmm. again, migration uh, processes. Uh, so they, I think that's, that's, that's which is important to propose like new, climate smart strategies or something that can mm -hmm. um, cover that gap. Okay, thank you. Um, now on mitigation. So who wants to go first, Eleonora or Anne? There were two questions. Um, yeah. I, I just start first from the decision, from yeah. the negotiation standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of mitigation, I mean, the, the climate convention started as very much a mitigation convention. Um, and so it was always seen as that it didn't involve people. I liked how you framed your question, you know, what, does mitigation have nothing to do with people? And you would think so if you'd looked at the text for a really long time. So when, um, when it first opened up after the Bali Action Plan in 2007 to the idea that humans were impacted by climate change or that, it, you know, individual people and communities could have solutions for climate change, it was always just a challenge to bring in that in terms of mitigation because it was linked with technology and often with large scale fixes. And again, so not seen as much as something that a person on the ground would do. But I think it's really important in terms of women's role that, as it is now, women are, are called vulnerable in terms of response measures, but there's not some guiding mandate that says that actions for mitigation need to be gender sensitive or gender responsive, which could include technologies that are appropriate and safe and environmentally sound so that they're not so <coughs> labor intensive or require as much um, sort of upper body strength that everyone could use them. And um, so it's just very slow. And again, with the big fixes, often because of the structures, the power structures we live in, women are not working in those spheres. So transportation mitigation fixes, panels are all men, most of the decision, most of the decision makers are men. And so what we're looking for now is a chance to see some of the small scale or local scale projects that have 
enormous impacts that we can bring in. Mm -hmm. And please. So I think the, the whole red framework fits kind of into that same idea that it's really, uh, it's quite technical. It tends to focus on these um, big monitoring and reference level setting and, um, and so on, and isn't so much about people itself. Um, but I think the key issue is sort of what happens on the ground. Red is very much something that's, that's a project or a, a, a program that would happen, would have very much um, impact right on the ground. And I think there, what needs to happen is that uh, there have to be precisely these gender responsive, gender sensitive analyses in these villages um, around what would in fact be the impact of whatever red turns out to be in any particular location. Red is very many things, so it's very hard to say exactly what it will be. Um, but, and at the safeguard level, my understanding is that this, the official safeguard documents are quite general. Um, and, but there are, are proposed safeguard uh, standards that have been set by other organizations. And the one that I've seen that's gone the furthest is the, I believe it's the UN Red, UN Women, I forget exactly what it's called, that actually talks about doing this kind of level of gender analysis and has a toolkit for doing this. Whereas other, some of the others are really just talking, saying participation, or when we say community, we mean men and women. Um, that's kind of vague. Thanks. I think Juan, you wanted to make a very quick si sí, eh, sí quiero agregar en relación a la mitigación los, los bosques forests the forests and the role in mitigation and in climate change in the past years they were precisely discussing this very strongly and at COM 10 in, was held in Cancun they acknowledged that the forests uh, had a very high importance for mitigation and this is also related with traditional knowledge of the indigenous people and the rights of the indigenous peoples and this is something for which uh, indigenous peoples are not looking things independently but in a comprehensive manner that's why they are working where they know is known as the holistic management of the territories for full uh, livelihood. They, they include everything, the resources, the water, and everything involved. That's a holistic vision that the indigenous peoples are developing currently, basically. So therefore... They just have to facilitate that they're able to do what they want to do. So now, Elizabeth, on the how can we empower uh, women to be champions of adaptation? Yeah, you're saying, how can we empower women to be, I mean, the last, but yeah. the way you put it? That's, I think, oh. how she tried to, yeah, that was her point. How can we, what can we do? I mean, that's a very broad and big question, and we have... Yes, indeed, it's very Rhythm broad, time, but, <laughs> but very important, right, a very crucial one. And I think, um, hmm. I think one important thing is to recognize the diversity of the situations, right? Hmm. I mean, in some places, um, for instance, management of water, as Cecilia was telling us, is important and in all of the sudden is mostly uh, um, something that women are doing because in the presence of migration and so on. So if we are thinking about um, adaptation, we need to consider that for in these cases, this is uh, climate change is actually affecting, as you were saying, much more these groups than others, right? And specifically women, it's increasing the workload and so on. But the thing is that um, the situations are very diverse. In other contexts, you will find that it's not water the main issue, but maybe it's actually the use of land or the caring of the forests and the management of wood. Um, what we have seen, and I can talk here from the Bolivian experience, the work we did with Corinne and Cecilia too in Bolivia, what we had seen is that um, in most of the contexts that we had studied in the Bolivian highlands, um, households where the organization of labor inside the household was more democratic, and it will say just mm -hmm. tended to be more democratic because, uh, you know, mo all of them were not democratic, if we are going to use this uh, word. But where there was more democracy in the sense that chores were shared between men and women to some extent, 
it was not only women who was in charge of marketing the agricultural products, but it was also men. They participated in their own way, you know, with some division of labor specifically. Um, also in terms of activities such as, the, such as the caring of the family, because that's where also household labor is organized for, right? Who takes care of the kids. In households where there was a tendency to be more democratic in the, in the organization of labor, such households were better able to cope with management of risks mm -hmm. and management of problems related to adaptation of climate change. Mm -hmm. And that was, that's interesting. And also the third thing, I'm sorry I forgot to mention, is that such households were also better off in terms of their incomes and their capitals, the access that had, right? The differences are relative. It's not that we're talking about equal participation of men and women inside the household and in activities related to production, reproduction, and care, but a tendency to more democratic organization of labor. Such households are associated with dealing better with risks and the management of risks, but also have a higher income levels and higher capitals. So the message here is that even if there are diverse situations in different contexts, geographic, economic, social, and political, um, tending towards more democratic organization of labor inside the household is very important. It's crucial. So this is an old question, right, of the debate in women and development and so on more equal organization inside the household, but it seems that it's an unresolved, obviously, and that we need to look at that. We need to, to, to realize what these differences are explained for, and one factor is actually that inequality in the way that household labor is organized is not associated with better coping strategies, regardless of the context, and it's not associated with higher levels of income and capital. Thanks. Now this very last uh, question that I promised is one short sentence. So what is the number one thing or what's the one thing, not the number one, but one thing that the negotiators should consider regarding gender, climate change and landscapes? Please. Uh, from, my, from my perspective, I would say there are two words human rights, that we need to make sure that we're considering that the negotiators have to have that in mind, especially with the new agreement coming. And so it's it, beyond human rights, it's two things. It's having a guiding principle on gender in this text so that it, it frames everything, but also talking about either gender equality or gender responsive actions in the operative text that it can, apply, can apply across the board and then have this impact on projects and development at the ground. Corinne. Thanks. Especially when we think about um, adaptation, my key message is figuring out and building capacities to work together from the bottom up uh, in order for the voices of women to be heard, but also for the voices of multiple cultures that are not mainstream mm -hmm. also be part of the decisions mm -hmm. and okay. solutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gladys? Mm. Bueno. Well, the indigenous women will ask the negotiators uh, to have an intercultural approach, to have an intercultural approach and also a gender approach because uh, they uh, leave aside the cross-cutting uh, approach. Uh, we need uh, policies more focused on women, especially on indigenous women, especially in knowing uh, our background. Thank you. There are some agreements already adopted uh, in uh, the COPs. Uh, I am more focused on COP16. In other words, the traditional knowledge should be included, the rights of the indigenous peoples and full participation and broad participation as active participation of the peoples should be included when distributing benefits in a fair manner. All these aspects should also include the gender component. Cecilia. Capacity, but 
making parallel processes with the local community, but also, I mean, encouraging the local community to be heard, but also on the other side of the communication channel to also people who are ready to listen, really, mm -hmm. not to just continue doing what yeah. the way they were doing. And not the just other, paper tigers. Yes, yeah. and, and so the other is like, I think that um, in adaptation programs and adaptation policies, I think, uh, into building all those processes, I think, in order to be like climate smart, what now is kind of trendy, this word is like, we need also to be gender smart, I guess. Okay, right. very good so. term, I like that. Let's do gender smart negotiations, very good. And so if for me, in the red context, I would say that if the status quo is inequitable, then interventions that don't understand and address those inequities from the beginning are doomed to perpetuate them. Thank you. And I, I, it's getting shorter. I like it. Elizabeth. <laughs> okay, this is a challenge. <laughs> but I would say that addressing the gender issue as transversal to everything as it has been done in the last, what, 20 years or so, I think it, it, it's not what we should keep doing. I mean, why? Because um, there is diversity, cultural diversity, as Gladys was saying, and Corinne too, social, political diversity, and we need to um, think about gender, and I don't think that transversal was the way that has helped us to look at the, the key and crucial mm -hmm. issues. Thanks so much. So please give our very uh, engaged panel and presenters a final hand. Thank you very much. And before you're allowed to leave the room, I want to tell you, I have to tell you that there is, there's a gender pavilion right out there and they have something called um, Knowledge Share Fair. So there's a lot of information on gender, climate change, adaptation and landscapes that will be shared out there. And please share all of your experiences because unfortunately we couldn't take all the questions. We couldn't also hear all the researchers who do a lot of work on this topic. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Bye.